Well, you can join me in opening a copy of God's Word to the book of Titus. And um, we'll be looking at the whole letter this morning. You can find uh, Titus in the Bibles that are around the room. So if you don't have a Bible, please do grab one. They're under chairs around you. And Titus is on page 998 in those Bibles. So we're in um, a couple weeks of considering the local church, and we usually spend one or two weeks this time of year to recalibrate to our vision as a local church. Next Sunday, we'll start a series through the letter of First Peter, um, so you can read ahead uh, for that, and we'll be in that for several months. So this year, with our uh, couple of weeks focusing on the church, we're looking at how God's Word shapes God's people. So the local church is God's idea, and so we want to know what his vision is for the local church. We don't get our vision from pragmatism, just seeing what works or what gathers a lot of people. We don't get it by looking at church fads and seeing what's working around the nation or world today, but we get it from God's Word. Again, because the church is his idea. So we don't just get to think, well, we'll embrace the idea of a church, but then we'll just make up how we do it based upon personalities and influence and fads. We want to hear what God has to say about this. And he has given us a blueprint for the essentials of the local church in the Bible. And there's a lot of flexibility with all sorts of details on how these principles and essentials get worked out, but these are non-negotiable essentials. So here are the kinds of important questions we should be asking about the church. What should a a healthy church look like? What should the leadership be like? How is it supposed to be led? Is it supposed to adjust to the culture that it finds itself in or reject it or a bit of both or something else altogether? Is it okay to just find a church with traditions that feel comfortable because you grew up with those traditions and you like them? Um, Is it okay to live stream every week, you know, or can it just be for occasional Uh, times when it's necessary. What should I look for in a new church if I move to a new area or I go off to college? In other words, what is a healthy church? We want answers to those kinds of questions, and so we're looking to God's Word to find His blueprint for the church, and we find much of that blueprint in letters like 1 Timothy and Titus. And so last week, we did a flyover of the letter of 1 Timothy, and we saw five priorities of A local church, we can summarize those with five words, the gospel, prayer, leadership, honor, and generosity, and we considered how those words get worked into the local church. This morning, we're overviewing the letter of Titus. So the Apostle Paul and Titus had been working among and establishing churches in the Greek island of Crete. Paul left, Titus remained. And now Paul's writing a letter to Titus to give him a vision for the churches there, for what's left to do in establishing these newer church plants. And the vision for the churches in this Greek island of Crete is still relevant for churches today in every culture and ours, of course, right here, right now. And at the heart of this instruction is this idea. The gospel shapes the church. So the gospel, the message, God's saving message through Jesus is to shape the local church in various ways. Every church has the privilege of letting the gospel message shape its life together. The gospel is not just a thin, superficial message. It's rich and deep and it's powerful and it can transform our lives and church. So Think about this. We're living in the midst of a culture that, in, in, in which it knows what it's like to get shaped by ideas, right? Ideas have consequences. Various ideologies have gotten worked into the cultural fabric of the West, but the gospel itself is a more powerful reality, and it can shape our lives and shape the church and shape culture. So let's read the opening four verses of Titus together as we begin this letter. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, 
promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I've been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this letter and that you give us guidance for how we're supposed to live and what we're supposed to do and the power to live this out as a local church. Thank you that we don't have to be adrift and recreating ourselves every generation, but that you've given us essentials and you've given us your word and you've given us your Holy Spirit. So we pray that we would be receptive to your word. We pray that we'd understand it rightly, apply it well, and live these transformed lives. For your glory, for the sake of the mission of the church, and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul's writing this to show how the gospel shapes the local church. He develops this letter with three main movements, and they're basically marked off by these chapter divisions in your copy of God's Word. We see leaders who apply the gospel, a community that adorns the gospel, and behavior that bears witness to the gospel. So that's how the gospel shapes the church in this letter. So let's consider each of these. So the first chapter, a gospel-shaped church needs leaders who apply the gospel. The first chapter focuses on leadership, but before Paul gets directly to the topic, he shows the heart of the whole letter at the very beginning, which is what we just read. We see his passion for showing how the gospel of Jesus shapes our lives. So he summarizes his life purpose in verse 1. Do you see that? He says he's God's servant for the sake of the faith of God's elect. So he, he is God's servant for the sake of seeing the ones whom God's chosen to see them come to faith and grow in faith, and not only that, but for their knowledge of the truth, which, and notice this phrase, which accords with godliness. So he's making a connection that he repeats in different ways throughout this letter. It's the connection between the gospel message and the behavior that flows from believing that message. So here he said, the knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. So there's a link between knowing truth and becoming godly. There's a connection between what we believe and how we'll behave. So what's the knowledge of the truth here? Well, it's not just truth in general. It's the truth of what we call the gospel, the good news, the the message at the heart of the Christian faith. He gives it to us in verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised. So this is the truth, the true message that God gives. He doesn't lie. It's in hope of eternal life, which he promised before the ages began, and then at the proper time, he manifested it in his word through preaching, the preaching with which Paul says, I've been entrusted. So Paul is preaching, heralding, announcing this true message of God's grace and the hope of eternal life through Jesus, and then people come to faith, and they get gathered into churches, and his focus here is that this message accords with godliness, means something like it fits with godliness. There's a natural, organic fittingness between the message of the gospel and a certain kind of life that he summarizes as godliness. Godliness refers to godlikeness in character. So if you believe God's message of grace, you will begin, if that message isn't just rattling in your brain but, but sunk down into your heart, you will begin to reflect God's character of grace. What you believe about Jesus, again, if it's not just intellectual agreement with truth, but a wholehearted trust in Jesus, a reliance on Him, a reception in your soul of His grace, then that should lead to and will naturally and supernaturally lead to becoming like Jesus. It's to shape our lives and our church. So in this first chapter, Paul then focuses on how the gospel shapes leadership. He explains his purpose in writing the letter in verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So Paul and Titus were part of planting these churches in Crete. This is at the heart of the mission of the church, Um, you know, the Great Commission, make disciples, 
baptizing and teaching them. That's not just a, a message to go out and share with individuals and say, now go do your little individual Christian life however you want. Local church is optional uh, for people that like that kind of thing. It's just you and Jesus. That's not the New Testament vision of Christianity. The, the message is to go and make disciples, and when you see how that happens in the New Testament, it happens through church planting. Gospel, the gospel shared, disciples believe, they're gathered into churches. And so Paul was doing this on the island of Crete in various towns. So you got these clusters of disciples, and then they were gathering together, and now Paul's left and he's writing to Titus saying, I'm writing to you so you can put into order what was left unordered. There's an order that needs to come to churches and for Christians to be gathered together. And so he says, in particular here, appoint elders in every town. One of the priorities of a local church, once you have disciples growing and mature enough, is to appoint some of those disciples to be leaders or elders of the church. That's the New Testament norm. Local churches should have a group of elders who oversee the church. So, this is one of the central things Paul was doing, and so he then gives a description of what these elders should be like. They're to be qualified men who lead together as a team. He's not just to appoint whoever he wants as church leaders. So what kind of men? Well, in many cultures, we might think of these characteristics if you're looking for leaders. They must be wealthy, influential, and successful. Paul gives a different set of three qualifications. They must be mature in character, in leadership, and in theology. So these are the qualities that Paul explains in verses 6 through 9. Elders needs to be, as he says, above reproach in their character, which means no accusation of moral failing can stick. They're to be humble, hospitable, self-controlled. And then Paul focuses especially on their theological maturity in verse 9. Notice what he says. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to do two things, to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So elders are to have a firm grasp of gospel doctrine. They're to be the theological leaders of the church. So they're not just men of good character, and they're, they're not just setting an example in character, though that's essential in what Timothy just, or Paul just wrote to Titus here uh, before this, but they're also to be the theological leaders of the church. And notice he says that they're able to do two things. Positively, they have to be able to give instructions. They have to be able to teach others. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be very competent in speaking to a few hundred people at one time. But they need to be able to instruct one-on-one, -on -one, counsel, in a small group. They're able to teach people what the Bible says about God and the gospel and what it means to be a Christian and so forth. And then negatively, they're to be able to correct those who contradict it. So they're to be able to have a, a keen awareness of when people are drifting from the gospel or when people are saying things that contradict true doctrine so they can identify the counterfeit and then they know how to correct it. They can say, well, now here's where this misses it. Look at these verses in the Bible. Do you see how, how what you're saying here, what this teacher or this book you're reading doesn't fit with what God's Word actually says? Now, there's a couple options how people interpret this, but this, this interpretation that this person's teaching is completely beyond the bounds of any plain reading of Scripture at any level whatsoever. This is, this is not orthodox teaching and so forth. Here's how one author put it. An elder must be able to teach and defend the faith. It doesn't matter how successful a man is in his business, how eloquently he speaks, or how intelligent he is. If he isn't firmly committed to historic apostolic doctrine and able to instruct people in biblical doctrine, he doesn't qualify as a biblical elder. Titus 1.9 requires that a prospective elder has applied himself for some years to the reading and study of Scripture so that he can reason intelligently and logically discuss biblical issues. It also assumes that he has spent these years, he has formulated doctrinal beliefs, and that he has the verbal ability and willingness to teach. So elders are to be men who have this mix of humble character 
and theological clarity. And both, and both are non-negotiables. Not just humble character, but unable to make his way around the Bible or help anyone else make their way around the Bible and doctrine. Nor uh, the kind of person that's been educated in theology, but that's just puffed him up and he's arrogant and he makes everyone feel like idiots around him. Right? Neither of those are a biblical elder. Why is this so important? Well, Paul explains why elders have to be godly theologians in verses 10 to 16. It's because if these men don't step in and lead, then other kinds of people will. Other men will lead with bad theology and bad character. So in verse 10, he explains the situation on the ground there. He says, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. So there's, there's people in this community, uh, men, women, just people here who are teaching false teaching or spreading false teaching. It's upsetting whole families, and it seems like in this case they're doing it for financial gain as well, which is often the case. Verse 16 shows the connection then that we're seeing throughout this letter between gospel doctrine and gospel behavior. While elders are to have both, these people have neither. It says they profess to know God. So they're saying they know God, they know the true God, they have good doctrine, but they deny Him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good works. So they say they know God, but they actually deny Him. And their life is what gives proof to that. If your life is not being transformed by the gospel, then that message is not getting into your heart. So here's why a church needs gospel-centered leadership, because gospel doctrine creates gospel behavior. Theological growth is to lead to character growth, and churches need elders who set the pace in this. They have a deep grasp of gospel theology, and they demonstrate that it has shaped their character And they have a willingness to help people along in these ways as well. The elders are to protect this connection between gospel doctrine and gospel behavior. So if someone's influencing with bad theology, which leads to bad behavior, elders step in because that can spread and shape the church. So we take this seriously as a church. We cultivate this among our elders. We also cultivate this posture among staff and other leaders. I shared last week the elders keep one another in count, accountable in our growth and character. We also grow in theological clarity together. So we regularly read the Bible and discuss books together. We spent the last couple of years slowly reading through the 1689 London Baptist Confession, which is like the Westminster Confession for Baptistic churches. We've read books on the doctrine of salvation, on church eldership, on church membership, on the roles of men and women in the church. We're about to read a book on the doctrine of conversion soon. As we look for future elders and just want to cultivate growth among uh, other people as well, we encourage people to grow in these ways. We regularly commend good theological resources, and as we think about future elders, we see which men bite, which men care, which men read those books and want to talk about them. I gather men together from time to time to study theology or to grow in teaching, and I watch how they respond. And then official elder candidates have a several-month process of including a lot of theological reading and discussions. We also have a high standard for character and theology among staff members. We value this among small group leaders, among ministry leaders in the church, among men and women, to be growing in gospel theology and growing in gospel character. So if you aspire to leadership at any level, this is a call to prioritize growth in both character and doctrine. Because a gospel-shaped church needs leaders who apply the gospel. Second, a gospel-shaped church also has a community that adorns the gospel. In the second chapter, Paul focuses on how the gospel shapes our lives and our relationship. And notice how he again makes the connection between the gospel and how we live. He says, but as for you, in verse 1 of chapter 2, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And then he lists behaviors. So he's saying there's a kind of lifestyle that fits with and accords with sound doctrine or healthy doctrine, good theology. And then in verse 10, after these behaviors, he summarizes some of them this way, so that in everything they, these people, may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. What an interesting way to put it. Our lives as Christians are to 
look in a certain way that you could say it's adorning doctrine. So you have gospel theology. This is what we believe about Father, Son, and Spirit, how He saves us through Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection and the outpoured Spirit and His soon return. And we take all of that, and there's a kind of living and lifestyle and behaviors that if you look at it, it looks like it's the doctrine, the truth, is being adorned. So there's a kind of beauty that is to be lived out among God's people. Not physical beauty, but moral and relational beauty. There's a way of living that is to adorn doctrine with a kind of life that's beautiful. So in the first 10 verses, he's showing us what this new kind of life and community looks like as the gospel enters our head and theology presses down into our heart and then it shapes our behavior and we see moral beauty. He addresses people in different life situations. So verse 2 addresses older men. So older men, listen up. Here's how the gospel changes the moral direction of your life. This is to be your trajectory. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. So it's a picture of a man who is sound in the faith, who's trusting Christ with robust theology. It's leading him to be a stable kind of man, a steadfast man, a reliable man, dignified, marked by love. So men, there, there is a reputation that many have about Christian men. Um, it's certainly, I think, amplified, magnified in the media um, and overdone, certainly, but there are enough examples of this in our culture um, that give credibility to that reputation. But it's not the vision Paul gives here. This is a vision that combines strength and love. It combines discipline with kindness. The gospel doesn't make men into trivial, superficial, unreliable men who just believe certain things about Jesus. No, it makes them theologically and morally stable and steady and faithful and strong. So men, look at the words in verse 2. As you're looking at those, which of those words has God cultivated in you most? And thank God for that. Even right now in your heart, just thank Him because that's a gift from Him. That's the effect of the gospel working in your heart by the power of the Spirit. Now look at that list. Which of those words do you think does not mark your life enough? Then I would encourage you to ask God for help, but also find another man and have a conversation about how to take steps forward to grow. And think in particular, not just what practical steps you need, but think what truth about God and the gospel, what theological wonderful doctrines can I believe more deeply, get rooted in my heart more to make me that kind of person? Gospel doctrine shapes gospel character. So talk together with another man about how that can happen. Paul next addresses older and younger women in verses 3 to 5. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, right? S spreading untrue words or gossiping. Nor should they be slaves to much wine. They're to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. So older women are marked by reverence, honest speech, not, ab not abusing alcohol. They're to invest in teaching and training younger women to grow in character. So this is an intergenerational vision of friendship and mentorship within the local church. The local church is to be a place where younger and older spend time together. Older women passing on wisdom to younger women. There's a teaching and mentoring dynamic here. And Paul gives a dignified vision of young women embracing marriage and parenting here. Now, that doesn't mean that every woman needs to get married or every couple will have children. Paul has other things to say elsewhere about the role of singleness for the sake of making disciples and so forth. But this is a general calling because God has built the family uh, into the world as a gift. Our culture has devalued this role. It's partly because we're reacting to a vision of womanhood that was shaped by the 1950s. There's a lot of reasons why our culture has responded. 
how it has over time. But if we can get past the caricatures, marriage and motherhood are noble, dignified callings. Our culture is reaping the results of a generation that has lost that vision. And I'm so grateful for how many of you women have recovered and lived out that noble vision. Paul then moves on to the younger men in verse 6. It's interesting, after all of these commands given to older men and older women and younger women, he says one thing to the younger men. Now, let's ask a question. Is that because the younger men of the church have really figured this thing out and they literally are only lacking in one characteristic? No. I don't think so. And I think we can tell by seeing what that one characteristic is. It's in verse 6. He commands them to be self-controlled. Think about it. This is the one virtue you need in order to do all the rest. If you can't be, you cannot be loving and kind and patient or devoted to goodness if you don't have self-control. Paul said in chapter 1 that Crete's own poets talk about the men of their culture, and they say that they're lazy gluttons and drunkards. So you can boil those issues down to a lack of self-control. They they can't control themselves with the way they want to waste time, or with their use of alcohol, or their consumption of food. And so they're overeaters, overdrinkers, and underworkers. Men who lack self-control live selfishly. And that creates a mess around them that other people have to clean up. So those of you who are younger, students in middle school, high school students, college students, other young men, focus your energy on learning to control yourself and control your selfishness. And when you see another guy without self-control or another middle school student without self-control or another college student without self-control, Here's what I tell my boys to do all the time. Just watch that person and see how things work for them. Right? Just watch how it goes. The the way they live, the way they talk, the way they treat people, it may seem appealing, interesting, cool by some standards, but just see how it turns out. Are they actually happy? Are the people around them actually happy? Like, how is it going for them? Just watch the trajectory of their life and see if that's anything you want to be a part of. So just watch that and then focus on self-control. Paul goes on, he addresses his, uh, Titus's uh, unique role as a pastoral leader, calling him to be an example. He addresses servants, calling them not to be rebellious or unethical in their dealings. And then the last part of the chapter shows more robustly how it is the gospel that creates this new way of living. So all through this letter, gospel shapes the church. So look at verses 11 to 12. For, so here's the connection, he gives all the behaviors, and then he says, because, this is the reason why these behaviors matter, for the grace of God has appeared. It's appeared in Jesus, bringing salvation for all people, training us. That's interesting. The grace of God that brings salvation trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So the gospel is this message of God's grace for people who have lived as ethical failures. It's all of us. And yet that very message of grace for moral failures is the very message that when you receive that, it actually changes your moral life and the direction of your life. The gospel doesn't just bring forgiveness, but transformation. It doesn't just calm us by removing our guilt. It changes us by training us to love. One of the very purposes of God in sending Jesus was to create not just individual Christians who feel forgiven, but communities and a whole new kind of humanity together as churches who are both forgiven and transformed. Verses 13 and 14 say this. Now we're waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Why did he give himself for us? Why did the cross happen? To redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people 
not just individuals around, but a people for his own possession. And, and what are they marked by? Who are zealous for good works, eager to become like Jesus, excited to put sin to death in life. Some of you are here and you're not yet Christians. Maybe you know of a professing Christian, but uh, they don't live like one. And you can tell something is wrong with that. Or maybe you do know a Christian who does live a kind of life of moral beauty. And you've wondered, where does that come from? With the first person that you know, they are not letting this good news of God's grace transform them. With the second person, they are transformed by the message of Jesus. And this is available to you as well. Jesus gave himself for us. He died on the cross for our sins, rose again, and he did it to bring forgiveness to you and to transform you from the inside out. His purpose is to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. So consider what it would mean to receive Jesus' grace for forgiveness and change. And for those who are Christians, we're called not only to believe the gospel, but to adorn it. We're to let it change our lives so that we embody God's love and grace. Whenever people come to our welcome reception after the service, we give them a book. It's a little green book by Ray Orland uh, called The Gospel. If you've been there um, and we didn't give you that book, um, come find me. I'd love to give you one. Uh, Sometimes we forget. But listen to the subtitle of that little book. It says this, How the Church Portrays the Beauty of Christ. The gospel is not just the message we believe, but it leads us to portray Christ's beauty. So here's what Ray Orland says at the beginning of this book. Gospel doctrine creates a gospel culture. The doctrine of grace creates a culture of grace. When doctrine is clear and the culture is beautiful, that church will be powerful. So chapter 2 gives us a vision of relationships that are intergenerational and beautiful in character. Now, that doesn't mean that we need a set of programs to set this all up with intergenerational relationships, although those are fine, and there's a benefit to that, and we have and will probably do things like that to help. But the way this best happens, and the main way this happens, is through church members, like you and me, being intentional. We put a strong emphasis in our church on this kind of intentionality. We believe that every member should feel a strong sense of responsibility, personal responsibility, to creatively take steps to make this life happen. So I encourage you to take a step, if you haven't in a while, to get to know someone younger and older than you. Older men and women can reach out and invite a younger person to grab coffee, to read the Bible, to discuss a book together, and as part of that, talk about life's challenges together. Younger men and women can invite an older person to spend time with them to, for these purposes. The initiative goes both ways. This is one reason why we encourage you to spend time after the service and move around and get to know the people who are sitting near you on Sundays it's so that we can meet people that we would not normally cross paths with in everyday life. And so we can meet together to grow. And so for those who are younger, you can get to know an older person. Those who are older get to know a younger person. Find a connection to grow together in friendship and mentorship informally. Christina and I just last night were over at the home of an older couple, and they are dear friends of ours, even though they are twice our age. And they've become our friends because a decade or so ago, they invited us over into their home for dinner, and they kept inviting us. And we've had a great friendship um, over the years, and we've learned a lot from them about how to grow as a Christian and live in light of the gospel. So as you pursue these relationships, do it with the goal of adorning the gospel and helping one another do that. This is a vision of a church that so enjoys the gospel and is so thickly tied together in relationships that the whole tone and culture becomes beautiful. So it's a community that adorns the gospel. Okay, last and and briefer, a gospel-shaped church has behavior that bears witness to the gospel. When Christians let the gospel shape their behavior, they become a contrast community in the culture. 
The church will be a light in a world of darkness. It will demonstrate the reality of Christ to unbelieving friends and neighbors and co-workers. Chapter 3 shows us how to do this, how we live out the gospel in our public lives. Verses 1 and 2 give ethic, the ethical vision. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. What a high standard. These characteristics call Christians to live as an obvious blessing to other people in our culture. Obvious meaning everyone should know a Christian, and if they know the Christian, they should be thinking, that person is marked by these things right here. They, they avoid quarreling, they're gentle, they're obedient to the government and not just resisting arbitrarily. Of course, there's limits there. We don't obey the government if it's disobeying Jesus, right? But there's a posture of obedience. Um, and then they show perfect courtesy toward all people. People should know Christians and think that's what kind of person it is. Your neighbors should have that view of you. Your reputation at work should be those kinds of things. It should be how people see and perceive your online engagement as kind and respectful and civil, even in disagreement. So how might people's view of Christians change if every Christian showed perfect courtesy toward all people? It doesn't mean you can't disagree. It doesn't mean you can't engage in conversation and try to persuade people to a better view of the world or a topic. But you do so in a way that they think, that person's so respectful of me. They listened to me. They cared about what I thought. They didn't treat me like an idiot. They didn't name call. They just reasoned with me and treated me with complete courtesy. That's a powerful witness. The, the bigger issue at stake here is not your reputation, but the reputation of Jesus. That's why he's passionate about this. Because this is the witness of Jesus in the world. So how do we get this? Well, once again, Paul reminds us of how the gospel empowers this change. So, look at verses 3 to 7. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. That's how those early Christians lived before they received the gospel. And then the gospel shows up and changes them. It's what many of your lives and my life looked like before trusting Christ. It's what your life could look like if the gospel never came to your heart. But what changes this? Verse 4, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So the gospel does not come to us and say, try harder, do better, go faster. The gospel says, whatever you've been doing is not working for you or anyone else, and you do not have works that could earn your way into God's favor. You do not have the strength to transform yourself. So God's giving you mercy, and that mercy is so powerful it changes us. There's a renewal of the Holy Spirit Paul talks about here. The Spirit's been poured out into your heart to bring renewal and changes you. And so this is why Paul adds in verse 8, the saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. So he's saying, Titus, do you want a church that is devoted to good works? Then insist on this message of mercy insist on this message of renewal, insist on this beautiful doctrine that God does not save us by our good works, and then you will see good works blossom up. The gospel culture sacred comes from mercy being planted in our hearts and watered in our lives, and this creates a beautiful culture of unity and love. This is also why dissension is actually such a threat and a problem, so Paul ends by urging Titus to avoid controversies and then deal quickly with those who stir up division. Verses 10 and 11, as for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, 
have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He's self-condemned. This is because when someone stirs up dissension, they're violating the gospel culture that's sacred. They're breaking unity for the sake of selfish interests. And when division spreads, it removes the beauty of the gospel culture and it derails the witness of the church. So that's Paul's vision for the local church. Leaders who apply the gospel, members who adorn the gospel, and behavior that bears witness to the gospel. So if you want to know what our vision is for Zionsville Fellowship, this is it. If you want to know how you can participate more fully and actively in the life and vision and mission of Zionsville Fellowship, this is what to pursue. If you want to know where we're going as a church, this is the direction we're aiming. If you want to know what makes us tick as a church, this is what makes us tick. If you want to know how to pray for one another and us as a church, pray in light of this. Whatever specific plans we're drawing up for the church over time, whether it's related to global missions or various ministries or church planting or programs or staffing or training or other changes, this is what we want to guide us. We never want to be a church that gets bored by the grace that appeared in Jesus. We never want to grow out of the wonder of being renewed by the Spirit. We never want to grow bored with the virtues that adorn the gospel And we want to seek every day to let our public behavior bear witness to the beauty of the gospel. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for giving us such a clear and compelling vision for the local church. And we thank you that you have cultivated this in significant measure among us as a church. And we're so grateful. And so we praise you and thank you for it because this is here because your grace has appeared in Jesus and has trained us to renounce ungodliness. And your spirit has been planted in our hearts to make us zealous for good works. We also confess and grieve that so many of us, all of us in various ways, have more room to grow in this. So we pray that you would kindle in us um, a passion for your grace and glory, and we pray that you'd cause us by the Spirit to adorn our lives with the gospel works, and that our behavior would bear witness to Jesus, and that in coming days and weeks and months and years, that we would look back and see that your Spirit's presence among our church family led to many men and women and boys and girls coming to know Jesus and being rescued from the corruption of this age and being brought into this family. We pray this also for other churches even this morning, even right now as the gospel and uh, the, the vision for the church is being given in churches in our area and around the world. We pray that your spirit would be at work uh, to create these beautiful communities of light. In Jesus' name.